Losing the ground in the battle for the hearts and minds of tomorrow's collectors, a once great franchise sent out a call for new recruits, a new kind of soldier for a new kind of battlefield. Surrounded by giant robots, spandex superheroes, and enough mutant ninja turtles to clog a sewer pipe, they executed a new plan. If you can't beat them, copy them. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of G.I. Joe Extreme. Thank you to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY to get 30% off your order today. 80stees.com started off as the source for t-shirts inspired by all things pop culture from the 1980s, but there's more to the 80s than just the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 70s, the decade that paved the way for the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 90s, the decade that carried on the legacy of the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 2000s, because the 80s isn't just a decade, it's a state of mind. Whether your interests are laser-focused on one thing, say, movies, there's plenty of choices from Jaws to Shaun of the Dead. If your interests bounce around, they've got shirts from cartoons to video games, superheroes to music and wrestling. From Transformers to Dungeons and Dragons, Gollum to Ron Burgundy, Darkwing Duck to Powerpuff Girls, from Pong to Street Fighter II. Their goal is to have something for everyone that loves retro pop culture. Whether your favorite cartoon is Gem and the Holograms or Robotech, or your favorite movie is The Karate Kid or Sixteen Candles, you'll find something you love. Click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order today. Again, that's code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order. Thanks again to 80stees.com. G.I. Joe Extreme is an animated series that ran 26 episodes over two seasons from September of 1995 to February of 1997, a reboot of the G.I. Joe franchise after a failed reboot just one year earlier. Ten years in the future, the year 2006, a former superpower collapses, leaving multiple factions vying for control. The threat is real. But take heart, because G.I. Joe is the codename for America's extremely daring, extremely highly trained, extremely special mission force. Its purpose, to defend human freedom against SCAR, the soldiers of chaos, anarchy, and ruin. The evil organization SCAR, whose goal is nothing short of total world domination, is led by a man known only as Iron Claw. Together with his band of evildoers Inferno, Wreckage, Steel Raven, and Rampage, they inflict as much damage as possible, as quickly as possible, situation critical. The odds are a million to one, and that's the way the Joes like it. Led by Lieutenant Stone and Sergeant Savage, the new Joes are ready to stop Scar at every turn. Ballistic, Black Dragon, Freight Harpoon, Mayday, Metalhead, and Quick Strike never give up. They stay till the fight's extremely won. G.I. Joe will dare. Hasbro's G.I. Joe first hit toy shelves in 1964 as the boys' toys answer to Mattel's Barbie, a system by which a core body could be purchased and then supplemented to infinity with various uniforms, weapons, accessories, and vehicles. Hasbro deployed the original 12-inch figure through the 1960s before reassigning Joe to less nationalistic interests. He spent most of the 70s as an adventurer looting tombs, fighting tigers, and occasionally hanging out with his superhero friends to prevent caveman aliens from conquering Earth. G.I. Joe got his first Total Body reboot in 1977. Renamed Super Joe, he fought against evil space invaders like Darkon and Gore, King of the Terrans. No longer a 12-inch fighting man, this Joe was downsized to be compatible with and competitive against Mego's 8-inch figures who were dominating the action figure market. G.I. Joe was rebooted again in 1982, reimagined as a series of three and three quarter inch figures, allowing for a full slate of vehicles inspired by Kenner's success with Star Wars, an approach that quickly propelled Kenner to the top of the industry to compete with giants like Hasbro and Mattel. G.I. Joe was one of the biggest brands of the 1980s, outlasting even Star Wars due to a market saturation approach made possible by the relaxed regulations of the Reagan administration. Kids couldn't escape the 24-hour-a-day barrage of cartoons, comics, games, toys, cereal, and other licensed goods, and we liked it! Twelve years is a long time for any toy line. To stay relevant, the characters' concepts and play patterns have to evolve with the market. By 1993, G.I. Joe was still a three and three quarter inch line of action figures, but his resources were stretched thin to accommodate everything from ninjas to space aliens, eco-terrorism, drug enforcement, Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, and even dinosaur hunting. In 1994, G.I. Joe was cancelled. But not for long, Hasbro wasted no time immediately redeploying Joe to the battlefield once again with a full-body reboot called Sergeant Savage and His Screaming Eagles, now standing four and a half inches tall. Returning to G.I. Joe's pure military roots, Sergeant Savage was a cryogenically frozen hero of World War II reawakened in the 90s with genetic enhancements, a procedure known as Marvel's Captain America. 
Sergeant Savage was, by all measures, a failure for Hasbro. And it's easy for us here in the future to point fingers and try to place the blame on everything from war fatigue to a customer base that was clearly more interested in things like Spawn, the Ninja Turtles, Street Sharks, Batman, the X-Men, and even Hasbro's own revival of Star Wars. The reality is, after the disappointing reception of Sergeant Savage, in 1995 Hasbro handed their G.I. Joe problem to Kenner and let them deal with it. Kenner, founded in 1946, became a major player in the toy industry when they took a gamble on Star Wars in 1977, forcing every other toy company to play catch-up for the next decade, chasing their idea of having their own Star Wars level of success. In 1991, Hasbro acquired Kenner as part of their purchase of Tonka. Kenner was a proven success on toy shelves through the early 90s with the real Ghostbusters starting lineup, Batman, Jurassic Park, Terminator, Robocop, Predator, and Aliens, successes that would influence their new direction for G.I. Joe. Kenner started from scratch, discarding everything from every previous version of G.I. Joe, except for Sergeant Savage himself, likely due to some sunk cost that needed to be recouped. This time around, it wasn't enough for G.I. Joe to be good guys. Drawing the line at superheroes was forfeiture before launch. The only rational path forward was to jump into the mosh pit of extremity, to use the tools that were already working for every other toy line on the shelves. It was time for Kenner to give G.I. Joe the real weapons he was going to need for the 90s. A look and an attitude that took no prisoners while remaining fully compliant with the Geneva Conventions. Extreme Times call for Extreme Heroes. G.I. Joe Extreme. It's the all new G.I. Joe Extreme. Bigger, bolder, and battle ready. Lieutenant Stone leads the all-new Joes with Ultra Slam Firepower against the evil Iron Claw and his Scar forces. Scar's Bone Splitter tank is brutal, but the two-in-one Sand Striker strikes back with long-distance Scar resistance. Battle damage! Extreme times call for extreme heroes. It's the all-new G.I. Joe Extreme. Figures and vehicles each sold separately. Ponytails, mullets, pouches, armor plates, rippling sweaty bear muscles, a disregard for authority, hyper-individuality mixed with unflinching pack loyalty, and a new voice to speak to a new age of radical adolescent power fantasies. Giant guns, bandanas, tactical straps, and faces that look like this. <laughs> Dream was the marketing buzzword, thanks in no small part to the X Games being the hottest new thing in sports entertainment, plastered all over ESPN and MTV, not to mention the hijacking of teen entertainment by a handful of comic book artists directly tapping the 7th grade zeitgeist, shunning Marvel and DC as they ventured out on their own to create image comics, reshaping the landscape in their wake. One man in particular, the face of this pop culture revolution, rising above all others in his Levi's Buttonfly 501 jeans as the head of Extreme Studios, Rob Liefeld, patron saint of pouches and blades, tactical straps, and faces that look like this. <laughs> G.I. Joe's extreme prone makeover was a mirror of the trends throughout the toy industry and an attempt to return to form. Conceptually, it wasn't that far from the themes of the 1980s G.I. Joe, but with 150 more pounds of beef and even fewer girls. Kenner's larger, less articulated 5-inch G.I. Joe figures were a spiritual continuation of their existing Aliens and Predator lines, and were positioned to appeal to kids who grew up with more gimmicks and less articulation thanks to Playmates Ninja Turtles, Kenner's own Batman, and all of those other lines I just mentioned. Packaging recognized the generational heritage of the brand with a new logo that echoed the original G.I. Joe logo from the 60s with the word Extreme gently splattered over it. Wave 1 featured a healthy assortment of Extreme Joes and the forces of Scar, plenty of launching missiles, weapons, tanks, jets, and even die-cast vehicles. Like the 80s toy line before it, G.I. Joe Extreme was supported by a syndicated animated series produced by longtime Hasbro animation partner Sunbow Entertainment, this time weekly instead of daily, which meant 26 episodes over the course of two seasons. This time it was paired with a package of next generation animated entertainment distributed by Claster Entertainment, The Power Block, paired G.I. Joe Extreme with Transformers Beast Wars, Vortech Undercover Conversion Squad, and, ironically, Reboot. In spirit, G.I. Joe Extreme was relatively true to the 80s cartoon, complete with PSAs at the end of each episode warning kids about the dangers of giving your address to strangers and telling them you're at home alone, or the deadly danger of building treehouses unsupervised and without instructions. To make G.I. Joe Extreme stand out from previous G.I. Joe media, the producers developed live-action sequences to complement the animated narrative, to bring the characters closer to the real world by depicting them in a new and exciting way. In a 2017 interview on Yojo.com, G.I. Joe Extreme writer and director Lloyd Goldfine explained that the live-action segments were a direct result of the live-action commercials that were used to promote G.I. Joe through the last days of the 80s line. Having worked on that ad campaign, he knew it was in an element that they could bring to the new series limited only by their imaginations, 
and the budget. The cast for the animated segments included Gary Chalk as Lieutenant Stone, Michael Dobson as Sergeant Savage, Richard Newman played Iron Claw. The live-action segments were performed by different actors lip-syncing to the voice actor's dialogue. G.I. Joe Extreme was intended to sell the toys, but developed by a team that was in no way involved with the creation of those toys. Buzz Dixon, who was one of the key writers for the 80s cartoon and 1986 movie, was brought back to develop the Bible and write the pilot episode. Unlike the original series where most episodes were interchangeable, Extreme was built with a deliberate narrative that developed characters' plots and relationships over time, a more mature approach to kids' animation that more and more cartoons were utilizing. The third prong of the Extreme reboot was a series of comics produced by Dark Horse Comics, a four-issue miniseries brought in top talent like writer Mike W. Barr, and covers by Frank Miller, Walt Simonson, and Norm Breifogel. Like so many transmedia brands before them, the comics and cartoons were developed by different teams. General elements like character names and designs are shared, but there is little overlap. Otherwise, the nature of the different production processes and schedules allowed for very little collaboration between the two. Dark Horse's G.I. Joe Extreme comics feature the retro-inspired G.I. Joe logo from the toys, but not the splatter of Extreme, perhaps an intentional omission with an eye toward a series that might outlive the short-term Extreme experiment. That said, the tagline on the top of the books read, Extreme Times Call for Extreme Heroes. The four-issue limited series did give way to an ongoing series, but after four issues, the ongoing series was cancelled as well. And it's easy for us here, in the future, to point fingers and try to place the blame on everything from war fatigue to a customer base that was clearly more interested in things like Spawn, the Ninja Turtles, Street Sharks, Batman, the X-Men, and even Hasbro's own revival of Star Wars. But the reality is that the comics weren't going to continue if the toys and cartoon, the major factors of the brand, weren't out there carrying the extreme load. G.I. Joe Extreme featured new characters that were, for the most part, disconnected from the previous generation of G.I. Joe, free to explore whatever past the writers and toy line took them down. However, when the toys in the series failed to recapture that Joe magic, General Hawk himself made an appearance, a tacit admission from Hasbro that the old team might still be out there if needed. After 26 episodes, G.I. Joe Extreme was cancelled, far short of the 122 episodes and movie managed by the 80s series. A second wave of toys was in the works but never released. G.I. Joe was taken off active duty for the next several years before another attempted reboot. G.I. Joe Extreme has never officially been released on any home media that our crack research team could find. If you want to check it out for yourself, as of this video, every episode is available on YouTube in varying degrees of quality from OK to... Regardless of the reception at the time of release, G.I. Joe Extreme lives on with official releases of some of the characters during the run of the 25th anniversary line. In 2013, Iron Claw was offered as an exclusive through the G.I. Joe Collectors Club, redesigned to fit the aesthetic of the 25th anniversary line. He was followed by Steel Raven in 2017, both characters being issued with official file cards and everything, newfound legitimacy, and an acknowledgement by the fans that with the passage of enough time and a long enough drought between reboots, when it comes to G.I. Joe, there's no such thing as too extreme. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free as well as a behind-the-scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and exclusive monthly podcast about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below if you went to the extremes in the 90s. Did you maximize your pouches, mulletize your hair? Did you get the funk out? Did you play with me? This is the second Extreme 90s video we've done where I desperately wanted to work at titles of the songs from the band Extreme and just could not make it work. I've failed you, I've failed the show, and most importantly, I've failed myself. All that's left is for me to get the funk out. <laughs> Cut! All right, ready? Yep. Uh, I feel like they're all gonna be that. It's probably right. myself. <laughs> 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 I don't know what to do with my hands. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs>